Welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology, talent and transformational change. With me, your host, Professor Sally Eaves. Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology, talent and transformational change. I'm your host, Professor Sally Eaves, CEO of Aspirational Futures. And today we're really drawing on inspiration from Girls in ICT Day, now in its 10th year anniversary. And we're going to be looking at very naturally different journeys in business and technology careers, really changing perspectives of what a tech career looks like, sharing experiences and lessons learned along the way. And things for me that stand out, I think will be part of our conversation, are mentoring, sponsorship, STEAM learning, a real passion of mine, I must confess, lifelong learning, scouting talent the right way, and commitments for tech as a force for good. And to do that, I'm delighted to be in the best of company. And that's Alexandra Gilante Jokelson, who is the Chief Talent Officer and SVP of HR at Hewlett Packard Enterprises and also a PhD. Welcome to the show, Alexandra. Lovely to have you here. I am so excited to be here, Sally. Looking forward to the conversation. Oh, thank you so much. Even just the two minutes before we started talking, I could feel the energy. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I was going to say, before I even jump into a question, your LinkedIn profile, you have Be an Ally right at the back of it. And I couldn't agree more. And I'm just going to share something with the audience that I read from your recent blog post as well. And you wrote, by listening and reflecting on people's stories, it gave me precious moments for mentorship. It allowed me to evaluate what was good for me. And to me, that's such an ethos to kind of start a conversation with. So thank you for writing that. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. No, it's my pleasure. I'm really, really excited to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I thought I'd make a start really by getting to know you a little bit more on your journey, because I think it's a particularly fascinating one. And maybe you could just share that a little bit more with the audience and you know, what's really helped you with your success so far. The first thing I would say will not answer your question directly, because I now being more mature, I hope, have an issue with the word success in this context because it looks very much like a perfect life that I have now. And then, you know, when I was a young girl in my home city of Sao Paulo, I watched other women especially talking about their successes. And and I looked at my reality and it was so different. It inspired me initially, but then it made me think, I don't think I will ever be as successful. I will not be as rich. I'm not going to manage to, you know, go, go so well. Definitely, I think I made progress in my life and I will talk about that. But there are many things that I want to be at this point that I am, you know, not satisfied with. So, yeah, that notion that now I have success is one that I just want to already share with people that I don't in everything I want to be or become in my life. And I think that that's a very important element of you know, the people listening to this out there think that success is a relative measure. And it's there is always the other side of the coin, things that we know we've not been successful yet. If that was not the case, we would not be human beings that are longing, right, for a fulfilled life. But back to the more mundane things, I guess. So, yeah, I, I was born in Brazil and Sao Paulo, like I said, a middle child of a very humble family, um, you know, lived in a neighborhood that was predominantly black. So as you can see, you know, I'm Caucasian. So I was privileged in that environment because when we left the neighborhood, people would not tell that that's where we live. And that uh, opened doors for me. So I think having that experience in, in the earlier years of my life made me realize that no matter where you stand, you always have some disadvantages and also some privileges. And, you know, nobody's guilty of having privileges, but you need to be aware of both. Um, and then um, a very brief comment on the, the remark you made related to mentorship and sponsorship. Depending upon where you are uh, on this planet, uh, right, uh, you will not have access necessarily to the best resources, to the most powerful people. So I always try to watch men and women, whites and non-whites, in what they did well and used those myself and self-reflected as opposed to depending on people to tell me what was next. So I think that that, that was uh, one of the things that made me achieve some progress. So it's to 
be very reflective, like pay attention to what's happening to the role models out there, even when you are never going to interact with them, but you can still learn and, and then incorporate whatever you think works for you. The last thing was, I was always very curious, you know, um, until I was 23, 24, I could not speak English. I couldn't afford to study it, but I was always fascinated by how the language worked and I would always pay attention and try to learn with the means that I had. And the curiosity is, I think, what brings us farther away, like from, you know, closer to what you want to be more than anything else. Just curiosity, I think, is, is a key word um, that I try to, to continue to, to use and to remain curious, you know, and hopefully forever in my life that will be the case. Oh, I couldn't agree more with that. I think it's something that's not talked about enough, to be honest with you, curiosity. And I find it a complete joy. I love learning new things from different people. I think it's something to be cultivated. I really, really do. And I love what you said about success. I must have been, I kind of deliberately said that because I, I wanted to see what you respond. And I, I couldn't agree more. And it just it kind of brings to the fore about how careful we have to be about the words that we use. They really do have such meaning and they can affect in, in different ways. And there can be unintended consequences from that. So I'm so please you said that and shared that because I, I believe in that so so strongly I think great examples I was going to go on to really you know asking you about role models visibility of that I think from that whole diversity of backgrounds is so so vital so there's someone out there that you can relate to at different stages in careers and think hey that could be me I can do that and so I think you really naturally covered that I think that's so important is there anybody that's particularly standard stood out for you in your experience when, when you were going through this and, and learning new languages and going through this journey? I still believe that, you know, being inspired by success and having role models is, is helpful, right? You cannot just look at them as perfection. And then by doing that, you feel distant from those as possibilities for you. So we are all born with huge potentialities, with huge ability to learn with huge innate needs for curiosity. And it's most probably the environment and sometimes our own self-criticism that shrink those potentials. So in that sense, having strong role models make you see that it's possible, not only in a paralyzing way because it was possible for those people, but I always think it can be me. It can be me as well. And that's the thing can testify to that, given my own journey. So I, for instance, I, I, I look for role models um, in the obvious ways, right? Of course, I take a lot of pride and energy, for instance, of interacting with these strong women that um, we have at the HPE's board. You know, if it was a predominantly white male board, maybe I would feel less encouraged, you know, to interact with them as an equal, right? As a, as a, as a human being. So it does help that we have, you know, African-Americans in the board, that we have Asians in the board, that we have female uh, leaders that are there. The same, you know, with NHB, our, our CEO, Antonio, is Latino. So, you know, he's a guy, of course, but I get inspired by knowing that, you know, it's still a very small percentage of people, but there are Hispanic people like me, you know, among the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. So absolutely, those more obvious role models, they need to be there. And it's our obligation to make sure that that happens, right? Because they have the merit. So it's just a matter of access to the opportunities. But I also think that each one of us is so unique. So if you are looking to you know, be better at something about yourself or strengthen something that you are already great at. You can also think about role models in that way. You can also then observe people that may be very similar to you or, you know, very opposite to you. But in that one attribute that you want to excel at, you have that in common. And so role modeling in a less stereotypical way, I think, goes a long way in the way we learn from each other. And so I like the more visible ones to be there as proof points that we can also make it, but I don't limit myself to first focusing only a few set of people. I think that in the environment we operate now, you need to be as plural as possible in terms of the influences you have. You have to watch news from the right. You have to watch news from the left. You need to listen to people that you disagree with as, as terrible as sometimes that feels. So you also need to look for role models that could be opposite of what you want to become. That in itself, in my mind, is the full definition of inclusiveness and diversity, right? That you, you are so flexible in the way you and your own values, you know, influence you 
that you are okay with, you know, expanding what you consider that is happening around you. And then you have judgment to know what applies to you. So yeah, I, you can tell I'm, I'm passionate about this topic. So I will shut up here and, and interact with you, Sally. But what do you think? I couldn't agree more with you. And one thing you can really see what the success has been had as well. Well, I was at part of um, a meeting recently saying about the women in tech retention rate, for example, at HPE. I think the attrition has halved in two years. So you're seeing that progress is being made, which is wonderful. And what you were saying there around inclusion and really having that broadest range of experiences and learning from different people, even if you do come from a different opinion point quite distinctly in some areas, I couldn't agree with you more exactly where we need to go and look for mentorship and bringing in those different experiences from a range of sources as well. I think social media is one example often gets a bad bad coverage around like, the negative aspects of that. But actually, it could be a really great community there to share values, to get organic mentorship. That's something that I've, I've cultivated a lot over the last few years. And so look for things in different places. Don't be afraid to reach out. If you see somebody doing something that you want to know more about, you know, ask that question. Don't be afraid to, to join in and do that, because I think you can really learn a lot that way as well. So yeah, really interesting examples there. Thank you for sharing that. And one thing also kind of drawing on this a little bit more is maybe changing the narrative around what a tech career looks like. You mentioned Antonio and his amazing leadership around tech for good, I would say in particular has incredibly impressed me and some of the things from the pandemic experience and the support that he's given there. And I think that's one aspect that can really help you know, showing the purpose that tech can be applied for. I think really helps to change what a tech career does look like. But what's your experiences there? How can we attract and get people curious, going back to that word again, about looking at a tech career and coming in earlier so one thing I'm thinking about is you know, using the UK as an example, kids take their GCSEs at age 14, roughly. And so they have to apply for that from 12 and above. And there's a drop off in girls taking STEM subjects at that point. There's another one about two years later when you're going on to A-levels. And then even at university, if young girls are taking these subjects and STEM options, by the time they're going into their careers, there's a drop-off there as well. So we've got these kind of three pillars of drop-offs around these subject areas. So I think we need to go in earlier to look at attracting people from a diversity of backgrounds. But what's your experience there? What do you think we can do to move that needle and bring more people in? No, I couldn't agree more with you, Salah, in the sense that the earlier, the better. And again, people are going to make their own choices, what works for them. But what I think we have to stop is to limit, is limiting the options that girls can envision for themselves based on social standards that are men and women made, right? Who said, you know, that, you know, there are less engineers that are female than male? Like, you know, so I, I totally agree with the examples you gave. And I think with the pandemic, we are also now confronted with the fact that even the ones that made the, the jumped the hurdles and made it into the workforce, predominantly in tech, the, the female leaders in tech have now to consider either, you know, dropping out of the workforce or reducing the hours because of the lack of infrastructure in the home, right? So in, in addition to everything you said in terms of the inflow, women are also at a higher risk of the outflow, right? So I do believe that, as we all know, there's the cliche, all companies are going to become technology companies, right? So the good news with that is that it's going to become very obvious earlier in the careers of everybody. If you are a doctor, if you are a dentist, if you are a nurse, if you are a teacher, you had to cope with technology, right? The pandemic showed us only 1% of, of what it will be, but technology is going to be with everybody in everybody's lives, everybody's jobs. And I think that will be a huge playground for girls and guys and boys, but predominantly girls to start to see themselves playing with technology, using technology earlier at scale, right? But I don't want to just be naive to say, you know, the fact that our companies are going to become more digital companies, that that will itself will take care of, of the issue by itself. So there's a lot, as we always talk about, that the parents need to do in terms of how they raise girls and the boys, uh, the schools, uh, what kind of classes, right? They, they put in grids, and the, the classes that students are going to go through. And then also in the companies, um, how much more effort we are putting now with programs that are for the high schoolers, like the younger adults, right? Like that moment in which before college, when they choose which professions to consider, that uh, tech is, is one of the options. And I, I always insist on that. I, I don't know why that is, but I get the impression by talking to potential candidates, 
some people think that most jobs in tech are very technical, but that's a myth, right? I mean, you have HR jobs in tech, you have finance jobs in tech, you have legal jobs in tech, you have management jobs, you have, you know, marketing jobs, you have sales jobs. So there are many, many roles in tech that are not technical. So one thing is to reframe the way young girls will consider career choices. The other thing is we in companies bringing the possibilities of working technology earlier to the workforce, to the future workforce. And then just lastly, is the other side of the coin that you mentioned. Once women are in the companies, then how to retain them and allow them to progress. And, you know, it's, it was a very tedious process that we went through at HPE about three years ago, uh, just in reference to the example you gave about uh, attrition of female talent. We digested, reviewed in detail the learnings from all the exit interviews to understand what was driving the turnover that we had. You know, because a lot of companies, us included, put a lot of effort on the talent acquisition piece, so hiring more. But then we don't necessarily take care that, you know, women that are hired stay, and then it becomes a revolving door. So we not only made sure that we hire above representation, like, you know, so we are always adding more women to the baseline in our levels, but also then deep diving on the qualitative information that was coming from the exit interviews. And then we, we analyzed those and grouped them together in, in teams. And some of them are very commonplace, but we didn't have it at the time. But since then, we extended the parental leave. We also, in the U.S. especially, you know, it's not, we should not take it for granted. It's not as common. And it's six months now, and it's parental leave. So our, our male employees also leave, you know, to take care, to be closer to their families when they have, have babies. So that's one of the examples. But we strongly leverage also flexibility of the workforce, you know, remote working flexible hours, and more uh, role model leaders at the middle management level as well, because they they touch a large portion of our employees, right? Not only top management. So yeah, it's a multitude of actions end-to-end, right, Sally, to make sure that we change the narrative and, and the performance of including women in the workforce in tech. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's so important. Completely different conversation I was having earlier this afternoon, because obviously it's Earth Day today, as well. And we were talking about the three R's and making sure that attention is given to sustainability at every single stage. And sometimes the attention is right at that last kind of couple of percent. Exactly the same thing about the issues we're talking about here. It's not just all about the onboarding. It's that listening and learning through why people are exiting as well, particularly around women in tech, as you were describing there. I couldn't agree more. It's that holistic, holistic view at the entire process, isn't it? And it's fantastic, the results you're having with that. And I think with the COVID experience, as you were mentioning there, ever more important to, to focus on that at the moment to make sure that you know where people might be struggling and adjusting to different transitions etc at the moment so excellent to see that so thank you for sharing that's a great example yeah you know in my PhD I, I studied a lot like social groups and then you know there is a whole line of theoretical studies about organizational ecologists um, and uh, I, I have a point here just bear with me but it is about any social group, you know, that is not diverse tends to be extinguished. And uh, so the sustainability of us as a society, and it's the same with animals in a forest, you know, and my, my, my loved uh, Amazon forest in Brazil is one of the richest, right, um, natural ecosystems that one can dream of. And then it thrives on that diversity, right? The reason for its sustainability is the diversity, and I think we don't talk much about that. And usually, tech, in the, you know, I worked in consumer goods before, we tend to talk about diversity more as something that will benefit the underrepresented groups um, in organization. But I'm a firm believer that this so whole system will benefit and will actually be more fit for purpose and, and will we'll thrive, will live longer, will be sustained, given so many uncertainties that we have to face as a species these days, right? Like who would have imagined COVID? We thought about it, but I don't think we would have bet our money that it was going to happen, right? A global pandemic at the magnitude we had. But any social group that is more homogeneous, even if it's only, you know, white women or black men, is at a higher risk of not coping with uncertainty than a more diverse group of human beings that have very rich, varied um, experiences in their lives, in their careers, have very different vantage points. 
And in my mind, it's a, it's a sustainability topic because of that. Otherwise, we will miss the point and we are not going to be as successful as a humankind as we could. I couldn't agree more. I've got something, I have a publication coming out later in the year that's very much talking about that. And you know, with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, obviously that there's a 17 of those and sometimes they're considered in you know very specific ways so you know SDG4 around education or whatever else it might be but actually the interrelation across all of these the entire ecosystem effect which you were really really covering there very well I think we need to look at problems in that way so I utterly concur with the way you're taking that and maybe outside of this podcast we could talk about that a bit more because that's one of my like research areas so I, I love what you were saying there so thank you for bringing that into the discussion that's brilliant and um, maybe one different point now just draw actually i'll just draw on sdg4 on, on education but looking at it from that broader point of view so take it from two different points of view one thing i think has been very positive trying to look on the bright side of what we've experienced all together is i think we've seen better collaboration you know there's been things like the hpc consortium for example so like 11 different tech companies coming together bringing together that computing capacity different people different talent addressing it to solve problems so in this case obviously around vaccine development and i think we need to do that in a similar way with some of these other challenges whether that's climate change or equally around education because we've also seen gaps get bigger. I think it's made it more visible where people have got access to, to, to technical kit to be able to access you know, remote learning at home, for example. But it's also shown where those gaps are. And in some cases, they're getting bigger. So what do you think we can do there to help you know, close some of these gaps, maybe better democratise that equal access to education opportunities? It's so fundamental, right? I mean, and I, I would say, again, personally, I think my trajectory is one more example that education is the lever to transform lives, like studying, having access to it, having also access through the internet to what was happening outside of my own small you know, reality when I was growing up is what made me realize what could be for me, right? And it, it took literally my family out of poverty. You know, like my parents, the immigrants, had nothing when they arrived in Brazil. And they did not study much, but they said, we are not going to leave you much money, but the three of us, my siblings and I, we will do two things. We are going to graduate in college and we are going to learn how to speak English. Those were the only things that mattered in addition to being kind to each other and to, you know, to people in general. But these were the two things, non-negotiable. And I can totally see how through education, I got access to brilliant people, to people that then became sponsors of mine. I got access to content that you know, my own network in the neighborhood could not give. And so it's not only the nice thing to, to do and to have, it's the only, maybe the main thing that we must safeguard, you know. And I, I know there are other issues, particularly in developing markets like corruption, political instability, lack of safety, right? But with education, you create a more critical thinking kind of workforce, you create more capable workers. So it's also fundamental for GDP growth. And But concretely then, because it's such an, an important asset that any decent nation has to have, I do think that the organizations have to play a stronger role as well, because we know how to do it at scale. You know, with all due respect to governments, in many cases, they are also behind in terms of digital transformation themselves. So it's so fundamental and it's going to benefit business and society so much that you know, companies like HPE or, you know, all the other big tech firms that honestly have make a lot of money, right? I think we all have a stronger role to play. And lastly, it starts even within our own workforce. You know, COVID, we at HPE, a large global organization, we, we have 60,000 uh, employees. If we do the math on average, right, each employee has a family of around two, right? So you are influencing three people, three times the 60,000 directly, right, with kids and spouses or aging parents in the home. So when the pandemic hit, we all worked, uh, started working remotely, and we will continue to do that. I mean, our, our model is to lean in heavily on virtual remote work, but we had to provide, you know, equipment and even a, a, money, a money allowance for people to make sure that they had the conditions to, to be connected, not only to produce it for HPE, in some cases, in, in emerging markets like in Brazil and India, the internet connection in the home that we were helping with was actually the access, you know, for some of the family members to go to school, right? So I don't I do think it's so fundamentally important that educated, you know, societies 
are consume more, they spend more money, they buy more technology, they are a better workforce. So business investing on it will be really for sure returning in more demand. And with that, then I, I do think because the tech companies especially are more equipped to driving it with the effectiveness, I think it's good to that we all feel more and more accountable for making it happen for, for people that work for us initially, but then you know to the society at large. Absolutely. There's a shared value proposition, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's all about that coming together. And, you know, we've had this awful contagion. Let's have a positive contagion now around around change. We've seen this co-creation around different solutions, better collaboration, more cooperation across you know, government, as you were mentioning there, big tech companies, but also research and academia. So I think we've started to break down maybe some of the silos that we've had in the past and really hope we can keep that momentum. We've seen amazing things done in amazing speed and and uh, and sustaining that over this period of time as well. So, yeah, if, if there's that shared responsibility, that leadership, to, you, know, you were saying there with the example about how many people are affecting in HPE alone, give the ripple effect there across the board. It's huge what we can influence. So using that sphere of influence for good um, is, is absolutely the way to go. So a lot to reflect on that, I think. And this is a slight tangent, but it's very much around education again. And kind of, I'm going to say implicit bias here because this is a particularly passionate area for myself. But there's a lot of focus around education for the last probably 10 years or so, and quite rightly, I think, in many ways around STEM. And um, I'm starting to look at how we can go, in my opinion, beyond STEM to STEAM. So really having the arts there as an equal basis and arts probably in its broader sense as well. But for me, that's all around things like emotional intelligence and I mean that creative confidence to, to imagine the future alongside all the tech skills to build it as well. And going back to something you said earlier in the conversation as well about you know what a tech career is and showing there are so many different things beyond coding, for example. So it needs that holistic skill base, in my opinion, about that. And I wonder what your take is on that. Do you think that's where we need to be hitting? You know, what skills do you think are, are most valuable, maybe the most underrated even? We mentioned curiosity a lot earlier on. I certainly think that needs more focus. I love what you just said, and I've not heard it before, to be honest. So congratulations on the innovative thinking there, because we kind of end up repeating each other a lot, right? So we know STEM in itself is a challenge that we have to bring more diverse talents to it. So, but if we expand it, you made me think, you know, that it becomes even more powerful because on one hand, you also have, I think, more diverse people that are more attracted to the arts, to the liberal arts. So you create also more appealing trajectory, also way to get into tech that we were discussing before. And you also enhance, enlarge the size of the talent pool, right? So there's that one hand, it's very, very, a very positive thought that I had not had before related to how to make tech appeal to more to a broader sense, a broader group of people. But I also want to comment on, on what you said that I, I really truly agree with, that I see HP, our development teams, our engineers, they really enjoy and thrive when they have the social connect, connections with our customers, with the end users of the services and offerings that we have. That's a very, you, you spoke about um, the positive contagion there, and I think it's the same in this example, that, you know, that even the technical people that are coding for, in our case, infrastructure software, right? Like, you know, we also have more uh, platform software kind, but we have sometimes very, like, software that most probably no user is going to see. Uh, but even those engineers, they benefit from learning what the ultimate use of our offerings are. And then interacting on a global basis with other employees and other customers um, in developing these solutions. So I, again, talking about becoming a holistic human being, broadest sense that you have technical skills, you have uh, human interpersonal skills, but you also have creativity, you have the need for innovation, you empower others. So I think you know, it's the, it, they make it all much more holistic. And, and then I also believe back to the example with the Amazon forest that the more diverse the ecosystem, the more cross fertilization there is. So, you know, no matter if you are less technical initially, you are going to become a little more gradually more and more technical and vice versa. If you are very technical in your the beginning of your career, by interacting with people with different backgrounds, you also become more holistic, understanding how technology impacts the human beings around you and that use uh, the solutions you are putting together. So I always think that diversity is so beneficial for the person immersed in it, not not so much to the for the diverse person. Like, you know, I learn much more when I interact with people that are very different. Like, you know, if I, just for the cliche, 
interact with my black uh, African Americans uh, friends, I learned so much by observing them, much more than if I were to be together with people that are more similar to me. So I think that it's a great point. I had not thought about it, and I think it creates so many more positive side effects. The less siloed mentality, this divide between tech and non-tech jobs is also arbitrary, and it creates a bigger pool of talent for us to hire from. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a word, isn't there? Bricolage. That's what I'm trying to think of. And bringing all those different elements together. And, and you're absolutely right. I get really excited when I hear something new. I get most creative when you can take something from a different sector or a different person or a different organ. You can just see how you can apply it differently. You get more creative yourself. And there's always a lot of talk about learning, but there's unlearning as well, isn't there? There's bringing things, different, different aspects together. I think that's how we get really creative. And I, I feed off that, I must admit, personally. And uh, I'd, yeah, I just very, very very passionate that a lot can be done with this and you know another thing as well you know we, we talk a lot about agility at the moment don't we organizational agility and resilience etc as well but I also think we need to look at that from the individual point of view and I really think that the STEAM approach can can help with that and it's not just like you know learning but how we learn being smarter learners being aware of like metacognition as well and helping people facilitate and understand what works for them well I know when I do a lot of speaking I, I wave my arms around a lot and I'm quite energetic and kinetic energy and things like that but we all do things in different ways and some people are quite Quite linear in terms of how they want to read things and some people want little bite-sized nuggets we're all very very different so really respecting that and helping people understand what works for them I think is another huge part of that learning facilitation as well absolutely and you know I, I always I tend to be very transparent and, and direct sometimes too much but I will maybe be a little bit more direct here like if I think still the majority of the senior folks in the workforce are white guys in most countries and I want to tell them, because I've been in HR for since I'm 17, I work full-time, and I've coached many CEOs, many very senior top management team members, and also interact with quite a few board members. And so if even, you know, sometimes for the white guys, it feels like this conversation about diversity, about inclusion, is actually no inclusive to them because they are like, nobody talks about things that a white man needs, right? And, and how we are now sometimes being attacked by, you know, being in positions of power that were given to us based on merit, right? So there is, you know, my, my husband is a, is a white guy. So I, I talked to him a lot about it. And um, based on everything I saw with senior leaders, everything I studied in terms of how our brains work, and also in terms of what is going to be good leadership going forward and the amount of followership that any leader is going to need in a remote, globalized work environment, to be successful, I would say, back to your point about learning and unlearning, for you to continue to experience the success you had until now, you will need to open up the, the kimono, you know, and, and then consider, immerse yourselves in as diverse experiences as possible, as uncomfortable as possible, because your brain has the neural paths. And we are used to certain um, ways, like a river. The water tends always to flow through the same path. But that, over time, is limiting for anybody, right? And, uh, and they're not to necessarily the fault of the white guys, but they are surrounded by more people like them. Then, you know, for us, being a minority in many groups, most of the time I'm surrounded by people that are very different from me. So even if I want it or not, I have to swim on that pool. But for them, for as long as they continue to be the minority, the environment for them is less diverse. And that's to their own personal detriment and development, cognitive development. So, you know, I, I feel so strongly about it in terms of, you know, good leadership development for the people that are the majority right now is to, you know, surround yourselves with diversity for your own growth, for your own career advancement. You're not doing it for anybody else, you know, and, and that's one thing that sometimes I feel myself talking to other women or other Hispanics, right? And we, we, we talk within our own echo chamber. But, you know, I think this kind of narrative in which diversity is the way to learn, particularly for the majority groups, is not spoken about that often. Um, 
Absolutely, absolutely. I, th- I think that's an excellent, excellent point. It really changes that narrative around a little bit. And yeah, I, I love that. I love that. And there's something I'm going to write off the back of our conversation at the moment. You know, we mentioned the Amazon quite a lot there. And I was literally envisaging the different kind of tributaries around diversity and inclusion and, and the different way you were taking it there. So I, I'm actually going to put a little piece together off the back of this. So you, you've inspired a, a different thought as we were talking through there. I love that. So it's kind of what we're exactly what we're saying there about learning in action, isn't it? So I, I love that. And maybe now I'm conscious of time because the time has whizzed by, which is a wonderful sign of a great conversation there. But uh, I'd love to take a minute, if that's okay, to talk about tech for good in a bit more detail. So I know we've covered this in, in a little bit already in our chat today, but I'd just love if we could take a moment to share anything that you've been doing at HPE or outside of that that you're really proud of. You know, it's part of your leadership role or a particular project that's really putting into action how you can apply technology um, and inclusive leadership for, for results that really, really last and make a difference and really meaningful change. I'd love to hear some examples about that. Well, thank you, Sally. And these are not going to be plugs for HPE. I think no company is perfect and uh, we all have work to do and tech, I think, even more than other industries. You know, I, I worked in healthcare, I worked in consumer goods and now I'm so happy to, to work in tech and I am very aware that there is a lot of things that we need to still uh, work on. But I will start with one program that we call Ready Now. And I will start with that because based on what we discussed, the top matters a lot. How the top looks like matters to to people. And uh, this program is about making some of our female leaders ready for their first board seat. So our board members, they sponsored this program together with our CEO and we selected a group, and it's a it's a cohort that you know. As soon as we place some of the female executives in in their first board, then we enlist new female leaders, HP female leaders, to, into the program. But it is a it is an experience more than a program in itself that starts with teaching these women what the principles of corporate governance, the difference between being an advisor in a board seat versus management, uh, behavioral protocols in the boardroom finance for board members, strategy in moments of crisis. So it's a series of um, skill-building workshops. But more important than that, it's we map the network that HP has to our CEO, our senior executives, our board members. And then we podcast, like we, we broadcast, we showcase uh, these female talents for companies that we think would benefit from having them on their boards, right? So these are very strong technical female talent that can help many organizations to, you know, accelerate their digital transformation. So that's one, uh, it's been extremely successful because, you know, it elevates the executive presence of our own female talent, but also expands their strategic thinking and their network with very senior people outside of the company. But that's like one for the very top house level, level, level of the house. Another one, um, I know we all have tracked diversity representations in companies, right? Like how many, what's the percentages that we have of you know, female uh, employees or ethnically diverse employees. But we are obsessed now for a year with the makeup of our top three layers in the organization. So we mapped, we have about in those three layers, so the EC and two other layers, we have uh, around almost a thousand teams and we have goals that are to eliminate lack of diversity. 100% of these teams we will have to have at least one diverse member before the end of this year, and then at least two before the end of 2022. We know that if we don't have a critical mass in the different teams, it's more likely that the minorities will resign as opposed to staying. So we, out of the 1,000 teams, there are about 50 that are still on that journey. So in most, the vast majority of our teams is already diverse. But I think the, the innovation there, if I may call it this way, one is to be very focused on the top, but two, it's to think about diversity in every single team because the way we all have counted representation so far is a bit imperfect, right? Like you can have, you know, 100 men in one department, 100 men in the other department. We will on average be like 50% diverse, but it's really zero, right? Because they work in silos, like they don't work together in necessarily the same team. So this is another one. And then lastly, training all the employees, 100% of the employees, on inclusive behaviors. I think we cannot only do it by hiring more people and, you know, doing the math and, you know, attracting and retaining, but the environment needs to be one 
that people can really be themselves. And I say it not as a cliche, like that, you know, we always use these words like true belonging, but we are, you know, really striving to make that a reality at HPE. Otherwise, we don't, it's not even for because it's the nice thing to do. It's because if we don't do that, the return on the investment doesn't come. You know, these things are not like the Amazon forest, like thriving and, you know, creating the, the innovation and the empathy with the customers that we need, that our shareholders need. So without inclusion, we will look all different, but still work together in these small clusters of people that look and speak the same. And so inclusion is fundamental for that. We are investing a multi-million you know, uh, amount of dollars in, in that journey of inclusive culture. Fantastic. That's a really tangible examples there. I absolutely love that. Uh, that there's a project I've been involved with with a university that's looking at the use of tech and empathy in not just onboarding potential you know new recruits, but as part of inclusive training, as you were describing there. And that's been a really interesting journey exploring that as well. So it's fantastic to see what you're doing there and a really you know, sustained commitment to doing that. I think that's wonderful. Kind of brings me on to, to different skills a little bit here as well, just as we kind of bring to a close a minute. But resiliency. Again, as I mentioned earlier, something that's coming a lot up at the minute, everybody's kind of been tested in various different forms, personally and professionally, I think, over the last year or so. So what what's helped you? I think that's always a nice thing to discuss as well about what, what have you learned through this process and well, how would you help people to think about how they can switch off, for example? So I think that's something that's come up in a lot of conversations um, recently. There you know, were different time zones and working remotely, kind of how, when, where's the off button, you know, with the different type forms of technology, et cetera. So what's your kind of switch off? How do you relax? How do you keep motivated? You know, it feels a bit like insisting so much on how diversity develops your brain. It may seem like we are advocating for our own causes here, but based on everything I studied and witnessed myself, it's not. It's really the way. Like, you know, I, I left uh, Brazil when I was 24 for the first time, but then more permanently when I was 26. And I moved to the Netherlands. Opposite weather, opposite culture in terms of, you know, how, you know, the Latinos are perceived versus the Dutch are perceived. And my English was still improving, and you can tell it's still going on. But at the time, I could, I had like severe communication limitations. I did not know how to get out of the parking lots because they require a coin. I had no clue how that coin system worked. I did not know how to read the labels of the food in the supermarket, right? Because Dutch is such a different different language from Portuguese. But so the first six months were painful, were really sad. And I thought I was not going to make it. But resilience, and I think we saw some of it with COVID. When you feel like you have no option, you you are given such a power, that inner power that comes from within initially, but then you have to keep it going, right? You have to sustain it. So I, I do believe courage is super important, like in addition to curiosity. So, you know, if, if you're curious, but you are afraid, it's frustrating because you want to know more, but you don't take the risk. So all these words are, are easy to say and hard to live, right? But the resilience comes in my mind from taking risks with situations that are very different and then you suffer initially, but then you you overcome them. In most cases, it's okay also to fail sometimes, but you overcome them. Once you overcome them, you become more courageous to take more risks and more risks. So I really saw it in my life. Like the, the, the career steps I took that were more similar to what I had done before were safer but I don't remember many of the learnings I had because they were less painful. <laughs> but, you know, moving to the Netherlands and then moving to the U.S. for the first time and uh, being away from my, my family. And then finally, like moving from consumer goods to tech, you know, for the first time, tech is an industry I did not know about. And I had a romanticized view, you know, that everybody's smarter in tech, everybody's better in tech. So it, it took me also courage to risk it. But I, again, we'll go back to, to your point in closing. For you to be able to react to uncertainty, and uncertainty are things you don't know are going to happen. And you, you know something is going to happen, but you don't know what it is. You cannot prepare for them. You just need to try to have a, this meta competence of curiosity and resilience, right, to, to embrace them. But for you to have those, the more diverse experiences you collected in your journey, the more weapons you're going to have to fight it when it comes. Because you can draw from one experience here, another experience there. But if your set of experiences are more narrow, 
then you're going to panic more probably, most probably, than have a, an idea because it's going to be the very first time maybe in your life that you are confronted with something that is so different. So I, I think that jumping you know, ahead and taking leaps of faith in the choices you make career-wise, life-wise, who are your friends, all those choices will help you either you know, to be more plastic and have more neural paths in your brain that make you more flexible and resilient, or will make you more likely to freak out and freeze um, because most of these uncertainty things will materialize in things that are never you never experienced before. Absolutely. It's almost like I'm imagining a toolbox at the moment. And it's that diversity of experiences to draw from, as you were saying there, and also going back to that foundation of education as well. So you've got those different holistic skill sets to tap into so that can help you to continually evolve. Whatever that uncertain future might be next, you're far more adept to be able to deal with it. And you've got that confidence to be able to deal with it as well. So I think we've got a few C's that are coming up here, aren't we? In terms of curiosity, that courageousness you were describing there, but also the confidence and the skills that are underpinning you and the experiences you've had so you can evolve through them and come through and really, yeah, really immerse in them and, and learn through that very positively rather than being afraid of it. So yeah, absolutely. I love those examples. That's pretty, really powerful. I was going to close by asking about some final pieces of advice. I actually love what we just covered in the last few sentences, actually. I think that really evolves it. But is there anything else you would like to add as, as just a close about you know, some nuggets to share with the audience about to help help people who might be experiencing this at the moment, who are going through this period of change, um, some, some top tips around that. But I do love what you just said. So I will draw from, you know, like, like my education, like it, just said on the on the importance of networking and networks and networking because I studied successful executives. Why do they do that others don't do? And one thing that less successful people do, they go back to prior relationships. When they're confronted with something, they don't know what to do with what they are confronted with. Some people go back to experience of other people that they have already interacted with. Which there's nothing wrong with that. But if you limit yourself to those, again, you are limiting the pool of ideas and solutions you're drawing from. So the opposite of it would be to always lean in to networking in the flow of your job with new people. Renew your relationships that you have in your life. It's hard, right? Because we're busy. We have to take care of our aging parents, our kids, our spouses, ourselves. We have a full-time job. We are educating ourselves on the side. And then now I come here and say, in addition to that, you need to network more with different people. But you would be able, I think, to find a way to network in the flow of your life. So it's not an on-top activity of everything else, but just reach out to people, learning from each other, but learning from new, different people. Absolutely. Diversity subject again in a different perspective. So I think we've looked at it from three different angles um, this afternoon, which I think is fantastic. So honestly, that's a great example there. And I think that really rounds off our discussion so well. And I'd love to come back and speak to you again, because honestly, I think there's so much we could dive to, into in more detail. And the more we talk, I can see of different angles um, to things, which is always a real joy. So I'm feeling a lot that I'm learning through our conversation as well, which I, which I love to do. So thank you so much, Alessandra. Honestly, it's been a joy to speak to you. And what I'll do as well, when we share this episode out, I'll send some extra links and things as well for the audience to have a look at, because I think some great examples that have come up in our conversation today. So thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I learned a lot from you as well, Sally. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tomorrow's Tech Today. If you enjoy what we're doing, please subscribe to us and leave a review. It really means a lot. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and see more behind the scenes video footage on YouTube. Thanks for listening.